Today we are in Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 35. I encourage you to pause the video and to read this text yourself. Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 35. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that through your word you would bless us, teach us, bring us again to repentance and, and faith in your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, the title today of the sermon is Great Faith in a Great Savior. And as I studied this text, it became clear that Matthew was emphasizing two primary ideas. The first, and, and as he often does, he's emphasizing Jesus and who Jesus is by piling up miracle after miracle, uh, proving to us that he is the Christ, the Son of David, the Son of God. So that's the first emphasis. The second emphasis uh, of Matthew is that he is promoting faith in Jesus. That becomes obvious by the amount of times that he highlights the faith of the various people uh, who are healed and helped by Jesus. And this is the case really throughout <clears throat> chapters 8 and 9. We see lots and lots of healings, dozens of healings and miracles. And, and today we have five more in our text. And and these are five um, kind of healings that Matthew hasn't recorded these exact same kinds before. So Matthew wants to show the great variety and the wide scope of Jesus' authority to heal people with all kinds of various ailments and diseases and, and problems. All to show that Jesus is the Christ, the son of David. And uh, my commentaries point to this prophecy from Isaiah that is helpful background for understanding the healings of Jesus. In Isaiah 35, it is talking about uh, what life will be like when God rules in the coming kingdom of God. And 35 verses 5 through 6 says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. These are the kinds of things that will happen under the reign of the Christ, under the rule of God. And at least two of the things mentioned in this prophecy, uh, healing the blind and the mute, happen in our text today in Matthew. And, and the point is so that we will see that Jesus is the Christ. He is the one who brings in the rule of God. And so let's uh, look at that first story in, in Matthew 9, verses 18 through 26. It's, it's one story, one unit of text, um, but there are two healings. The main story is, is uh, this ruler, a synagogue ruler, has a young daughter who has just died. And on the way there, Jesus gets interrupted by another lady uh, who has this uh, perpetual bleeding problem uh, for 12 years. And so he heals her right in the middle, and then he continues in, in going to that man's house. So it begins with this synagogue ruler coming to Jesus. He kneels before him, and he says in verse 18, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Okay, this demonstrates great faith, because up to this time in Matthew's gospel, Jesus hasn't raised anyone from the dead. He's healed lots of people, um, he's cast out demons, but he hasn't performed a resurrection yet. And so this demonstrates great faith on the part of this ruler. And so... Uh, Jesus agrees and, and he goes to he follows him to his house. But while he was on he's on the way to this ruler's house, he gets interrupted. Uh, verse twenty says, And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. So my commentary says that this bleeding or this hemorrhage was perhaps a menstrual disorder, but importantly for this context, it, it rendered her and anything she touched ceremonially unclean. Okay, kind of like the leper, although she didn't have to live outside the community, but still she was considered unclean. A very unfortunate condition for this Jewish woman. She had suffered from this bloody discharge for 12 years, and other Gospels that tell the same story says that she spent all the money that she had on doctors and she hadn't gotten better, she'd only gotten worse. Um, but she had heard these reports of Jesus and how he heals people and she thought to herself, 
If I can only touch the fringe of his garment, I will be made well. In verse 22, it says, Jesus turned and seeing her said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. He encourages her. Uh, she, she was probably scared, right? She had fear and trembling, Mark's gospel says. Jesus says, take heart or cheer up, have courage. Daughter, daughter of God, your faith has made you well. And again, he, he emphasizes her faith. In several of the healings, Jesus or, or you know highlights the faith. Um, that happened a little bit ago in chapter 9, verse 2, where it says, And behold, some people brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And then later he heals them of being paralyzed too. Um, there are several examples where Jesus highlights the important of the importance of their faith and in response to their faith heals them. Um, there's also an opposite example. When Jesus <clears throat> goes to his hometown of Nazareth, um, it says, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So that's the opposite example. And so clearly Jesus favors those who believe in him and in response to their faith, uh, he heals them or he saves them. In the case of the people of Nazareth, in response to their unbelief, he does not perform many healings or miracles there. And it's clear that Matthew records these uh, things like this so that we won't be like the people of Nazareth, but instead we'll be like this poor bleeding woman, or we'll be like the ruler whose daughter had just died and believed Jesus could raise her up. Uh, he wants us to be like the two blind men um, who believed that Jesus could make them see. And so Matthew records... Uh, examples of people with great faith so that we too will have great faith in our great Savior. Let's finish that first story um, in verse 23, chapter 9, verse 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, and so here it's clear that the funeral things are already taking place. It was common, actually required for Jewish families to get a couple flute players and often they'd hire some professional mourners um, to assist with you know getting the emotions up for mourning so basically the funeral had already begun and, um, and, and but what does Jesus tell them in verse 24 he said go away leave for the girl is not dead but sleeping and they laughed at him okay um, now Technically, she was dead. And I can say this because Luke's gospel says this, tells the same story, and it says that when Jesus heals her, or when he sp spoke healing words to her, her spirit returned. Her spirit returned to her body. And so that shows that for a time her spirit departed, was not with her body, and that, that's when a person is dead. And so why does Jesus say here that she's sleeping? Well, it's, it's a wonderful way to talk about death, especially the death of believers, because that death is temporary, because God will wake them up, okay? Um, Daniel 12, 2 says, prophesies, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And so there's one example of how the Bible refers to, to death as sleep, and it points to the resurrection of the body on the last day. Uh, so the next thing Jesus does is he, he makes her death temporary, very temporary, much more temporary than the death of you or I if we were to die today. Um, let's read verses 25 and 26. But when, but when uh, the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through, through all that district. And so perhaps this is the greatest miracle recorded in Matthew yet, uh, unless you count the miracle of the incarnation at the very beginning. But, but this is surely a great miracle, raising this girl who had died. And it points to the fact that one day Jesus will raise all of the dead, right? Where, where he will call all the, all the dead to come out, come out of the tombs or out of the ground, and they will. Let's go on to the next healing. Uh, in 9, 27 through 31, we have the account of the two blind men. And we remember, as I read earlier, Isaiah prophesied about this time when the eyes of the blind shall be made to see. And notice in verse 27 what they call Jesus. They say, 
Have mercy on us, son of David. This is the first time um, I think someone calls Jesus that in this gospel. Son of David, it, it's a Christological title, meaning he's the Christ. Um, a lot of passages I could go to to teach what this means, but I think the clearest is in Luke 1, when the angel Gabriel tells Mary what's about to happen to her. He says to Mary, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. There it is, son of David. The, he, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And so all of that should come to your mind when you hear that title, Son of David. And these blind men call him Son of David, but they also say, have mercy on us. Clearly, they believe that this Christ is one who has mercy and who has power to heal them of their blindness, just like the Old Testament prophesied. Uh, Jesus actually tests their faith before healing them. If you read closely, you notice he doesn't heal them right away. In verse 27, they, they followed him. They were crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. And then verse 28 says, but when Jesus entered the house, meaning he listened to them for some time, they were following him for some time, but Jesus just got to where he was going, went inside the house before doing anything to them. It says, when he entered the house, the blind men came to him. They actually went inside the house. Then Jesus asked them a question to further draw out, draw out their faith. He says, do you believe that I am able to do this? So he, he's trying to get them to, to say it, to confess their faith. And, and they say, yes, Lord. You see, true faith in the heart really should lead to a confession of faith in Jesus as Lord. And then they say, yes, Lord. And then Jesus touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And so in response to their faith, Jesus heals them. So far today, we've seen four healings, right? These two women, one woman, one girl, and now these two blind men. And now let's read about the fifth one. Very short, very brief. This is actually the last healing in this section of a whole bunch of healings in chapters 8 and 9. It's very brief. Um, as they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And so this man is, you know, you can be mute or, or deaf and mute without being possessed by a demon. This guy was possessed by a demon that caused him to be mute and perhaps deaf also, but it focuses on being mute. And, and when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And so Matthew recorded, has recorded so many miracles in uh, chapters 8 and 9. Why did he include this one? Well, he's already showed Jesus casting out demons. But this one is unique in that this, this demon made this man mute. And I think Matthew wanted to show that Jesus really did fulfill every aspect of that prophecy from Isaiah 35, which included the phrase, and the mute will sing for joy. And so Matthew wanted to highlight this miracle of Jesus healing someone who is mute. It's not the only time Jesus did this. Later, he'll heal someone who, who is deaf and mute. Um, so, you know, the, and also this last healing concludes with a great contrast that I think is very important us to recognize. It concludes with these two very different responses to Jesus. Lots of the people, you know, marveled and they said, we've never seen anything like this in Israel. But the Pharisees on their part, you know, they said, um, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. And so this shows that there were these two very different responses to Jesus. On the one hand, some people had wonder and amazement. Many of them put their faith in Jesus, that he indeed was the Christ, the son of David. On the other hand, people like the Pharisees rejected him. They were jealous of him. Uh, the Pharisees even ascribed his miraculous power to the prince of demons. They couldn't deny that he did these miracles, but they said he must be doing it by the power of the prince of, of demons. And, and this is a charge or an accusation they will repeat against Jesus later. And such opposition to Jesus really 
from a literary perspective, it's foreshadowing. It foreshadows what is going to happen to Jesus toward the end of the gospel, where he will be um, betrayed and arrested, and crucified, suffer and die uh, for our sins. But isn't it amazing that, that people like these Pharisees can, can witness these amazing miracles of Jesus and yet still not believe in him? Well, let's look at verse 35. It's a summary statement. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. This is just a summary statement. Jesus was bringing the kingdom of heaven near through all of these things, both through his teaching, through his preaching, and also through his deeds, through his miraculous healings. He, he was showing people that the kingdom of heaven has come near. He was proving that he is the Christ that the Old Testament prophets spoke of. Well, let's have some closing applications. Um, again, I just want to repeat that Matthew is really focused on these two main things. One, he's been trying to show us who Jesus is. And by means of all these various miracles, Matthew is showing us that Jesus is the son of David. He is the Christ. And he not only has power and authority, but he has mercy. He has come to help people who are suffering from the effects of sin and who are on their way to death or oppressed by demons or even that little girl who had already died. Jesus has come to save them and to heal them. Um, he, he has come to save us and he has come to bring in the kingdom of God. And, and then the, the second thing Matthew is highlighting is the importance of faith. So often in, in this section, chapters 8 and 9, Matthew or Jesus will point out the faith of the people who come to Jesus, like the faith of the paralyzed man and his friends, um, the faith of the centurion. I didn't mention that today, but that centurion back in chapter 8 who believed that Jesus could heal his servant just by saying the word. Um, in today's reading, we have the ruler who believed that Jesus could raise his daughter from death. We have the bleeding woman who believed that Jesus could heal her just if, if she touched his garment. And then we have the two blind men who, who believed that Jesus was the son of David who was able to heal them from their blindness. So in, in each instance, Jesus commends their faith. And clearly, Matthew presents all these examples so that we will imitate their great faith. And so how do we do that? How do we get this great faith? Well, Mark's gospel, uh, talking about that bleeding woman, it says that she had heard the reports about Jesus. And that's what led her to come to him for healing. And I think it's safe to say that that's probably how all of these people came to their initial faith in Jesus. They heard the reports of Jesus. I suppose some of them uh, firsthand saw him doing these healings. Some of them were in the audience as Jesus was teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But whatever it was of, of those scenarios, the principle holds true that we learn about in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of Christ. You could translate that, hearing the word about Christ. That's how these people are brought to faith. It's by means of the word. Um, other passages in the Bible, I'm not going to read them right now for the sake of time, but, but other passages teach that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to faith. Um, the, the true identity of Jesus must be revealed to us by God. Right? That must, you know, Simon, son of John, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Um, pa other passages show us that, that the only way to really know Christ and his saving benefits is by the Holy Spirit. To come to believe that, that through his, his death and resurrection, we have forgiveness of sins and, and, and eternal life. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so ultimately, the Bible teaches that faith is a gift from God, but it is given through the word. It's given through the gospel. And yet, even though it's a gift, we can exercise this faith. We can practice this faith so that it becomes stronger. Uh, we can do this through prayer, through having habits uh, uh, of praying, set times during the day, and also praying throughout the day. In prayer, we bring to the Lord Jesus our daily needs as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Every single day, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, and we ask for our daily bread. Um, I, I trust that every single day you ask God for help and guidance, and for wisdom as you go about your day, 
You want to do the very best you can in your vocations to serve others and to glorify God. And when you become sick or hurt or people in your life, certainly we should pray that God will heal them. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Um, so we should practice our faith. We, we should also feed and nourish our faith. And, and, and that's a little bit different than practicing our faith. I think our faith is fed and nourished primarily through the means of grace. That is through the word as we read it, as we go to church and hear the word preached and taught. Our faith is nourished through receiving the Lord's Supper. And our faith is nourished and fed as we have fellowship with other believers. But the main thing is going to be the, the word, the gospel word about Jesus Christ that tells us who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He is the Christ. And it tells us what Jesus has come to do. He has come to give up his life as a ransom for many. He has come to die and rise again for the forgiveness of our sins. This is what strengthens our faith. Amen.